So hi everyone, we just wanted to stop in with you for a few minutes and talk about your very first IEA expense report. We know that it's new for some of you and some of you have been doing this for a while, but we know there's also some hiccups now and again, and we wanted to see if we could help make this a little bit of a smoother process. I have a friend in education that talks about the curse of knowledge. And the curse of knowledge she defines as when you know something, it's hard to teach it to somebody else because you forget what it's like to not know that thing. So I don't have the curse of knowledge with IEA expense reporting because I've never done this before. So it's not, e it's not hard for me to, to play dumb with this because I kind of am. So I'm just going to walk through this expense report with you guys, and I've got Shelly and Marissa on the, the call with me today, and they are the ones who probably do have the curse of knowledge because they know the expense report inside and out. They'll be the ones that are checking your expense reports when you submit them, and they know what it's supposed to have on it and all of the ways to make this an easier process for everyone. So when we walk through it together right now, they'll be able to answer my questions as I look through it and probably don't understand it as well as you guys do. So let's look at the expense report together. Just so that you know, if you start out on our IEA uh, website, if you go to the IEA forms over on the left side, the expense report is probably about halfway down. It's in the list over on the middle of the page. It just says IEA expense report. So if you click on the IEA expense report, it gives you a lot of instructions at the top. And I would suggest you actually read those instructions. That probably is the best way to start out if you are new to the program, or even if you've been doing this for a while, it's probably a good idea for this first expense report to refresh your memory about all of the things that you should and should not be doing with your expense reporting. So if you go down to the bottom of that screen, it tells us to click next to get started. Uh, before you get started, I think it's probably a good idea to go ahead and collect all of your receipts from that previous quarter and have those in front of you and ready to go before you start even entering anything for that expense report. Also remember the period of time that you are submitting that expense report for. If you go back to our IEA uh, home screen, let me get back to the home screen, and look at your key dates, that's always going to be a good reminder. So for this quarter one expense report, we're reporting from July 1 to September 30th. Now, I know if you're a new account holder, you haven't had money from July 1 through September 30th. So you're just reporting for whatever period of time you have had money available to you from the IEA program. But if you're a renewal account holder, you have had money for that whole time. Shelly and Marissa, would you have anything to add about the instructions or anything else they need to have ready and available to them before they get started with their expense report? Not at this time, Bear. Great. Thank you, guys. I don't want to leave anything out. So to get started, it asks you for your basic demographic information. So the name of the account holder and your email address. So I'm just going to enter those basic pieces of information. Your student name. I'm going to enter my sweet baby dog in there as my student. We're in quarter one right now, and it already defaults to that, and it defaults to the current uh, contract year as well. So those are ready to go. If you get in the middle of an expense report and your kid comes in the room and needs your help or whatever you're cooking on the stove is about to burn up, you can always save and resume later. So you've got that choice on every screen that you get to. But we're going to keep going on our expense report. And the first question it asks is, did you use any IEA funds this quarter? And you have a question, I'm sorry, you have answer choices for yes or no. Uh, just so that you know what it looks like and you know how this works, even if you spent no money for this quarter, you have to enter an expense report. So if, um, if I spent zero funds in quarter one, I would just answer zero. And 
anytime you see the red star in Formstack, it means you have to put something in that blank. So I spent zero funds this quarter. I have to put a zero in that blank. So if I say that and click next, it's going to skip all of the rest of the questions on this expense report and take me almost to the very end and tell me if I have any additional comments, I can type them there. So Shelly, Marissa, I know you told me something earlier about uh, something that's important to put in additional comments. Well, what was that you guys told me? If if uh, if I've returned something, what something like that? If you have a refund or a credit that you've had um, added back to your, your debit card, um, you would need to put you first you need to contact us and let us know what's happened and we will tell you how to deal with with that situation. And then you'll need to also put comments on here about exactly what happened in that situation that you're in. OK, good. Thanks for that reminder. So if I've had a refund or a credit, I'm going to let Shelly Marissa know. IEA questions, uh, email or the phone number, and then I'm also going to type it in here and then I can click next. And then I have some assurances, which basically is I understand that there are laws that govern this. It's in statute and I promise I'm not lying about my my expense report. I have to sign it with my mouse or my finger. I'm not good at this at all. And then it's set to default to the current date that you are submitting your expense report. And I click submit form. So if you didn't spend any funds that quarter, this is an easy expense report to do. But you are required to submit that expense report whether you spend any funds or not. So I guess that's the big takeaway for that one. I'm not going to submit this one because I want to have some time to go back through some of the other options. I'm just going to go backwards and say, what if we did spend some money? So I'm going to say, yes, we spent some money. We spent a lot of money. We spent $2,000. That's a lot of money to me. I don't know. So I spent some money and I say next. And then it's going to ask you a series of questions about what did you spend your money on? You know, there's, I don't know, 12 or 13 different categories of things you can spend your money on. So it's going to ask you a question about each one of those. And it kind of gives you some hints in the gray box about what all of that means. So the first one is, did you spend money uh, on tuition at a participating school? So if your child goes to a school that that IEA funds can't be used for, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about, did you spend money at one of the participating schools with the IEA program? So I'm going to say, yes, I did. And you have a drop down menu of all of those schools that participate with the IEA program. I'm just going to leave it on that first one and say that's where my child went and um, it didn't cost me much this time. I'm just going to say uh, an amount. And then it asked me what months did that tuition cover? So that was just for the month of September. And I paid for that um, the first of September. If I've got another tuition expense, I can say yes. And uh, it opens up another part of this form where I can enter uh, another tuition amount. So if that school, um, you know, I paid on multiple dates, if I have more than one receipt where I've paid, uh, if I paid separately for September, for October, for, um, for August, I can enter them all separately. I can just keep saying yes, and it'll open up more of those for me. Or I can say no and go ahead and say next. Anything, Shelly Marissa, you want to interrupt me on? I do want to make sure that they understand that they need to have the date that the tuition was paid. They also need to make sure that that receipt has the school's name and has the month in which they're paying, especially, you know, if, if it's multiple months, if it's separate months, we have to know what months of service are, are they're using the funds for. Wonderful. Thank you. And yeah, most of our... I'm sorry, go ahead, Marissa. Sorry, and also on the receipt, please make sure that the name of the school and the address of the school is located on that receipt. We must be able to verify um, that you're using the funds at the school um, in which you're paying the tuition fees. Wonderful. 
And I think in my scrolling, I must have confused this because I put 200. Whoops, not 1200. And it somehow got changed. So I think, yes, my scroll bar on my mouse, when I'm scrolling, it's changing that amount. So be careful with that if you are using a mouse with, you know, the little wheel on it to scroll. I did not know that changes the amount in that box. Just a, a thing to remember if you're, you're not paying attention to that, it might get changed. So I'm going to move on to the next one where it asks, did you use any IEA funds this quarter for fees at your private school? And again, it gives you a little hint if you're doing any type of assessment at your school or um, your school charges fees that, um, that all, all students at that school are required to pay. Make sure you have that invoice and we're going to record them here individually. So it asks for the description of the fee, how much it was, again, the date of purchase, and you can keep adding others there because remember it said we're going to record them individually. And please on those fees, make sure those are fees when you pay them that they are acceptable fees to be paid. Some fees we do not pay like field trips. You cannot use IEA funds for field trips. Very good, thank you. I'm not going to fill out every form for the sake of time, so I'm just going to pretend I said no to that. The next one asks about textbooks that are required from a participating private school. Now, most of our schools um, don't charge extra for the textbooks, but if your school does, then you also have a form that it asks you to complete, and then you could submit for your textbooks here. So you've got the textbook name, the amount that you paid, again, the date that you submitted that form that we were talking about, and that form is also on our website. You're not going to wait to find it here. You would have already found it on the website. The date of the purchase that you made, and again, you can open up more fields here to add more textbooks. Shelly and Marissa, do not interrupt me. I'm going to assume that we've covered everything that we need to cover there. Again, I'm just closing these out by saying, no, I did not have one of those expenses. But if you had an expense, you would go ahead and fill it all out and then say next. Tuition and fees for online learning courses or programs. You would have already had a pre-approval for this before you would be submitting it on your expense report. Online um, classes or courses uh, can be approved under certain circumstances, and you would find out more about that in our handbook, of course. That's, that's not what this webinar would be about, but uh, we plan to teach you more about that in the future as well. Um, you would enter the name of the company or the school that was providing that course, the name of the course, when you got pre-approval for that course. So you would go back and find that information in your email when, when Shelly would have emailed you back about your pre-approval. You would give us the web link about that course, how much you paid for it, the date of purchase, and then you've got the option to open up more fields to be able to uh, enter more if you had more than one course. Our next category would be public school services. Uh, we don't have a lot of this happening, but you do have that option to contract with a public school for different um, approvable courses. Um, if you had a public school that you wanted to contract for your child to participate in band, or maybe for um, um, an advanced placement course that they offered and you wanted your child to be able to participate in that. If your public school is agreeable for that, then you can contract with them for your child to participate there. And it tells you what must be um, attached in here with the, the invoice and everything that has to be submitted. So you would just um, basically fill out your information, describe what your child was participating in for with that public school and submit that. Post-secondary uh, tuition and fees. Now look at this one carefully with me because if your student has expenses for dual enrollment courses or, and I went back the other day and made this or bigger because I missed it the first time I read it, 
or if your child is a post-secondary student. And if you have not read about that in the handbook, I would suggest you go back and read that because that's not um, that's not just available for, uh, well, let me see if I can get that better in my brain. That's not just um, as easy as it is for a K-12 student. There's a lot of restrictions there. You don't have quite as, as much leniency with post-secondary. So go back and read that in your handbook. But there's some, some caveats there for how you're able to get post-secondary eligibility to continue. But if you've got post-secondary tuition or fees, whether your child is duly enrolled or they are out of high school and still continuing, then you would record those expenses here. So you've got your post-secondary institution, uh, the address, if it's public or private, and then the description of what your child uh, is doing there, what kind of um, expenses they incurred, and then the amount, date of purchase, and then you've got the option to do more of those there. Shelly, Marissa, I'm going to count on you to interrupt me if I'm missing something here. Again, just like you had with your participating private school, with your post-secondary school, if you have some textbooks, you would enter them here as well, but you've also already done that post-secondary required textbooks affidavit form, kind of like you would have done for your, your K-12 affidavit form for your textbooks. So let me show you what that part opens up to look like same type of information that you would have done for your K-12 textbooks. You would just enter them here. But if you have none of that, you just say no. And then we get to educational therapies and services. And I know Marissa and Shelley are gonna have to help me here. So educational therapies and services, if you used IEA funds during this quarter for educational therapies, you would say yes. And then you're going to give us the exact name of the exact therapist that you used. Uh, you can only get pre-approval for the exact therapist that was going to be working with your students. So that's the name you're going to give us here. Uh, if they have a business name, you can give us that as well. And then the date that that pre-approval was, uh, was given to you goes here the total amount, dates of purchase. So if you saw that, if your student saw that therapist more than once, you're just going to list out all of the, the dates and then the dates of service. Shelly, I'm confused here already. You guys, Shelly, Marissa, tell me the dates of purchase versus the dates of service. What What's the difference here? The, the dates of purchase is gonna be the day that you actually um, made payment where the mm. date of service is going to be the dates that you had the services provided. Thank you. I don't know why that was just eluding me, but that makes so, so much sense. So the date your child saw the therapist is your date of service, but the date that you paid the therapist is your date of purchase. Thank you. Marissa, were you going to say something? No. Okay. And then you've got the option to say you need more of these as well. So if you saw another therapist, then you can keep going with more of these entries as well. Is there anything, uh, ladies, that I'm missing on telling them about the specific therapist that goes here? Anything I that want, I do yeah. want to remind them that they must seek pre-approval for every therapist that their student goes for services for. So if you're uh, if you go to a speech therapist and you've got pre-approval and all of a sudden maybe they leave and you get moved to a different one, you have to get pre-approval for that additional therapist before you can use IEA funds to make payment to that therapist. Thanks, Shelley. That's a lesson that's been hard learned, I know, by some of our renewal account holders. And it always breaks our heart when it happens because sometimes uh, you guys are just innocent in it. You know, your your student is seeing a therapist that's at a clinic, and there's a lot of therapists there. And when your student gets called back to see the therapist, you're out in the waiting room, 
and you're assuming they're seeing their same therapist, your student doesn't come out in the waiting room and say, hey, mom, I saw a new therapist today. Uh, they're, they're just coming out and saying, let's go home. I'm hungry. It's time to go to supper, that kind of thing. And then when you get the bill, you see, oh, my goodness, he saw a new therapist last week and you didn't know it. But you get pre-approval for a specific therapist, not for the whole gamut of people in the back. So if you get pre-approval for a therapist, we always suggest that you make sure that therapist and the therapy group understand that it they can't move your child around. They've got to make you aware if they're going to to make a change in therapy providers so that you can seek pre-approval for whoever else is going to be seeing your student. So thank you for that reminder, Shelley. But just to move on, I'm going to say no, my child did not see an educational therapist in this, I'm sorry, yeah, in this quarter. And we're going to move on to tutoring and say uh, that, yes, we did see a tutor this quarter. And again, here's our reminder, we had to have pre-approval for our tutor. And same caveat that Shelley just mentioned, it's a specific tutor that you got pre-approval for, not a whole group of tutors. So still filling out the information of when you got that pre-approval, what subject your child was being tutored in, the total amount, and then here's that, the same thing I, I was confused on before, the date of purchase or the dates of purchase, and then the date or dates of service. And you still remember the difference in those, when you paid versus when they actually um, tutored your student. And you can open up more of these with yes or no there. Anything else there, Shelly and Marissa? Yes, now we do have it where they can get pre-approval for a tutoring facility. That yes. means that the facility itself is pre-approved. Um, so they can use whatever therapist, or I mean, I'm sorry, tutor <laughs> that, you know, in that group. Um, so it is a difference, and there's two different pre-approval forms. There's one for a tutoring facility and one for actual individual tutors. If you receive it for an individual tutor, they can only see that tutor. If you receive it for a facility, it is only good at that facility. So if okay, you receive so it for Huntington Learning Center and in Murfreesboro, say, you can't switch it automatically over to the one in Hendersonville. Mm. So that makes me uh, have a follow up question, Shelley. So I can have a tutoring facility approved with one form and I can have a specific tutor pre approved with another form. But when I'm reporting them on an expense report, either one goes on this one page of our expense report. Correct. OK, so whether it's a facility or an individual tutor, they both go here. Good deal. Well, I'm going to say no. My little Izzy did not have tutoring services. She wouldn't sit still long enough for it. So let's go to the next one. Curriculum. OK, this is one that we have a lot of expenses paid out for curriculum. So let's say that, yes, we spent money for curriculum. So all we have to do is give the name of the curriculum. We're going to say, uh, did we receive pre-approval, yes or no? And I'm going to stop right there and say, uh, this one is a little bit weird about pre-approval because a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, you, you were required to receive pre-approval for curriculum. And now you are not as of, what, two years ago, maybe, ladies, uh, that, that was changed. You do not have right. to have, good, you do not right. have and to have. Unless it's online. Right. One that we talked about earlier for online that you're you're buying, then you have to get that. But if it's just a piece of curriculum that you want to have in your possession that you're using with your student, then you do you do not have to seek pre-approval for that. You can seek pre-approval for that if it's something that you're kind of iffy if this is going to be um an approvable expense. We do look at those sometimes with you and and try to 
to think through it with you and kind of as a courtesy more than as a requirement. So I think that's why the question remains on the expense report. Did you seek pre-approval? Because some people have still had a pre-approval hanging out there where we have kind of done that courtesy approval for it. Uh, as our program grows bigger and bigger, we're able to do fewer and fewer of those courtesy pre-approvals just because of capacity of our staff. But if you do have one, just go ahead and mark it so that we know that we've already investigated that with you. Um, if you can give us the date of your purchase here and then the total amount spent on whatever curricula that you bought. And then if you purchased any supplemental materials that are required by the curriculum. So if you bought the main part of the curriculum and then there was a teacher's manual that went with it, that's supplemental. Or if there was some type of extra workbook that went with it, you know, that type of thing goes in there. And then if you purchased another piece of curriculum, you can um, say yes and open up a whole other one. Uh, Marissa worked on this, I think she said last year. I think I played around with it last week and it opens up maybe up to seven of these now that are in here that you can just keep opening up and adding more of these. Unfortunately, if you purchase more than that in one quarter, uh, you have to just finish out this expense report and, and start all over with a second expense report if you need to keep adding more of any one item and the form won't accommodate as many as you bought. That's just um, a limitation of the program of what it will allow you to do. Shelly, Marissa, what have I left out? I think we're good, Farron. Yeah, I think we're good. You guys are such good teachers. You taught me so well last week. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm saying no for now so that we can keep going because I'm getting a little wordy and taking up too much of you guys' time. So let's see if we can keep going. Uh, this one is about computer hardware and technological services. Again, you would have had pre-approval for this one. So we're going to say, yes, we bought something for my Izzy on this one. She loves to type, let me tell you. She walks all over my keyboard. So we said, yes, we bought something. We tell what they, that was that we bought, um, the date that we got pre-approval, how much we spent, the date that we purchased it, and we can, buy, we can open up more uh, fields here. That one seems pretty straightforward. I don't see Shelly Marissa unmuting to talk, so I think we're in good shape. So just to move on, I'm going to say no. Transportation service provider fees. When I first looked at this one, I said to Shelly Marissa, we don't use that one much, right? And I said, yeah, we actually do get a few that, that are using transportation services. So remember, we can't pay for our own gas to shuttle our kids around to their therapy and their schools and all the places that we have to take them. But if we're using a commercial transportation provider, like a taxi or a bus, or I saw one the other day come through that somebody was using kind of like a van service that's that's for people with disabilities. And those are things that we're able to, to uh, consider for transportation service fees. So, um, we can say yes here and give us the name of the transportation company, the destination. So um, how specific would this be, Marissa and Shelley? Is it just like a city or do we want to know we were going to the therapist, we were going to doctor? What, what do we want there for destination? Yes, we would need to know if they're going to a therapist, a doctor, or uh, the child is being transported to school and back. Okay, so you don't want this the city that they're going to, you just want the type of place that they're going? Yes. Okay, good deal. Because I would have probably told you like Nashville or that kind of thing. So Well, good that would be nice to also put on that line as well, just to know that, you know, it was in the Tennessee area. Okay, okay, good information. Uh, we'd want to know the amount that you paid, uh, the date of purchase, and then again, you can open up more there. I love that it already tells you, I can say, I can brag on it because I didn't do this. So it, it tells you what the receipt needs to show there. So you've already got that information. It's also a good reminder if you're about to hire a, a transportation service of what you need to make sure is on that receipt when you get it from your, your service. 
I'm going to close that one out so we can move on to the next. Uh, testing fees. So if you have a student that you are needing to have assessed for our annual assessment requirement that we've talked about, and um, you're going to have to pay somebody to do that testing fee, that could go here. Um, when I was looking at this one the other day, I asked Shelley Marissa, okay, so what if I'm wanting to have my child assessed and it's not for that annual assessment? What if it is you know, I just need to have my child assessed to know where they are. So I know where I'm starting with with testing my child. And do you guys remember what you told me? Y'all want to take this one? They're probably thinking, I don't know what I told you, Farah. Y'all just, you asked me too many questions. But I'm going to see if I get this right, and they'll interrupt me and tell me if I'm wrong. They tell me as long as it's one of our IEA approved assessments, and that's in your handbook, that's what it tells you up here, then we're able to use IEA funds for it. Shelley, am, am I misquoting that? No, you're correct, but you can also use IEA funds for testing for like ACT, SAT, PSAT, that, that kind of situation also. Very good. I would have forgotten to say that. Anything else that I'm forgetting here? Okay, good. And again, you can open up more for here if you if your student has taken more than one assessment there. So close that one out. Uh, the next two uh, contributions or um, expenses, and they are contributions here, are for Coverdale and ABLE. So this first one is for Coverdale. You would have already submitted your Coverdale contribution request form, and Marissa would have processed that for you. If you made a Coverdale contribution in this quarter, you would have said yes and given us your financial institution's name, the five digits, the last five digits of your account number, when um, Marissa approved that form, and then the dates of whatever contributions you made, and then the total amount of your contributions that quarter. Marissa, is there anything else? Yes. <laughs> yes. So the date that it was approved, always put the date that um, you submitted the form. Um, ah. please always use that date. Um, if I don't email you back saying that I need additional information, we always use that date. Okay, Marissa, so that brings up another question. Is that just for Coverdale or is that for any pre-approval request that you always use the date you submitted the form? Um, th this would apply to uh, Coverdale and ABLE uh, contributions. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good clarification. So for Coverdale and ABLE, whatever date you submit the form is the date you put here for when it was approved. Thank you, I, I did not yes. know that. Okay, well, let's move on and look at the ABLE one then. Same thing uh, as the Coverdale almost, um, except now you have to enter your ABLE TN IEA identification number. Marissa, will they know what that is? Where will they find that? Uh, that is the uh, number that starts with nine and ends with 02. Please put the 02 number there as IEA funds can only be deposited in the 02 account. Very good, thank you. You know things that um, I have no idea about with ABLE and Coverdale. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I think that one, rest of that one is pretty self-explanatory. So I'm going to say no and get myself out of that one. Debit card fees. Um, I don't know that you guys have a lot of these, but there are some places that calls that charge like a service fee when you use your, your IEA debit card. So if that happens, you, you can use your IEA funds to pay for those debit card fees. Uh, you, you want to list those on your expense report because otherwise things don't balance when we start looking at your debit card and comparing it to your receipts and to what you put on your expense report. Things won't balance if you don't list those fees here. So you want to write a description of the fee, the amount uh, that you 
you have here and then the date that the fee was incurred. And I added another um, option here. I think now you've got three options for, yeah, that you can add debit card fees here. So if you've got any of those debit card fees, you want to list them here. Okay, moving on. This one is where you get to be honest. <laughs> So, um, you know, you've got all of your cards in your wallet, you're checking out at Kroger, the, the lady's asking you to put in your, your Kroger rewards number, the, the checkout person's asking you if you want your gum in your purse or if you want it in the bag, your kids are trying to escape and go down to play with something somewhere else, there's lots of noise, you reach in your purse, you grab a card, you scan it, and about the time you, you do that, you realize that you just scanned your, your student's IEA debit card instead of your personal debit card. And you're like, I don't know what to do. So, Shelly Marissa, tell us what you do in that instance. You just paid for your groceries with your student's IEA debit card. Well, first of all, um, you will need to um call us or email us and notify us. I mean, we would prefer to have it in writing. So please just email us and let us know um, what has taken place. And um, you will also need to report that um, on this expense report. So you used it as a non-approved expense. So you're just gonna let you guys know mm -hmm. and you're gonna say in here, I accidentally used my card at Kroger you're going to tell us the amount, the date of purchase, when you notified the department. I hope you notified the department as soon as you got home. And um, I hope you don't have any other non-approved expenses. But if you do, you're going to say yes and report those as well. Now, we have had instances where people used it at places other than Kroger. Like maybe they they were at their child's doctor's office and they scanned the wrong card or maybe they were ordering something, you know, they'd been ordering curriculum on Amazon and they clicked that card and then they were going to order shampoo on Amazon and they clicked the wrong card. And Shelly, you were telling me that you guys sometimes ask people to do something else when they notified you guys. Sometimes it's possible that if you contact the provider that you're using, like if you say, in, I had a circumstance where an account holder has two students that they homeschool. One student's an IEA student, one student is not. They had purchased a uh, curriculum for their IEA student, had that card on file, which please don't put your card on file <laughs> if you can keep from it. I know on the online, sometimes it's a little difficult to do that. But in this circumstance, they had done that previously. Well, they went to buy curriculum for their non-IEA students and they purchased that curriculum using the IEA debit card. In that situation, what we had them do is contact that um, provider and explain the situation. They refunded that money back onto the IEA debit card, and then they were able to use their personal debit card to purchase the curriculum for the non-participating students. So if, if in situations like that, you may be able to get that reversed and charged to your personal card. Um, when that happens, let us know, like we said, email us, tell us, we will give you, you know, possible ways of getting that refunded back. And then you would explain it to us in this expense report in a later section that will explain a little bit more in detail. But in that situation, they were able to get that refunded. So you don't have technically a disallowed expense on your expense report to report. Yeah, that would be the 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 goal is to get it corrected and not have to put it on this part of your expense report. But if you can't, then you you need to be honest and go ahead and admit that yeah, we goofed up because I mean, it happens. So that's just life sometimes. So if you you realize that you did something you shouldn't have done, let's just go ahead and admit it, put it on the disallowed expenses. But if you notify uh, us at IEA questions at tn.gov, we may be able to help you work through it and get it corrected before you have to report it as a disallowed expense. That would be the preferred outcome anyway. 
So at this point on your expense report, you've finished answering all the questions and you are ready to upload your receipts. So when I was reading through this the other day, what hit me the most was I've been telling you that you could hit save and continue if if the the pizza in the oven was needing to come out and you needed to go tend to that and then come back to it. But here is where it shocked me because I was reading through this and at the bottom it said, when you are uploading your receipts, if you choose save and continue and you're not finished with uploading your receipts, it will not save what you have uploaded so far. So I went into this and put that in red. So this will remind you when you get there. Once you start uploading your receipts, you need to finish this and, and not do save and continue because you're going to be uh, wasting time and you don't want that to happen. So you, all you have to do here is uh, choose your file, upload something, and then move on. So you want to upload all the receipts to back up everything that you just put in your expense report. Now, I thought I was being smart. And when Shelly and Marissa were walking me through this, I said, so on my receipt, you want me to like circle what I purchased and write my name at the top of the receipt and write my student's name on it and highlight the amount. And Shelly and Marissa, what did y'all tell me? We do not want account holders writing on receipts. The, the receipt has to be the original receipt from the company, from the school. Um, no altering the receipts. Yeah, I thought that would help. And they were like, no, do not write on the receipt. And I guess it makes sense because they said sometimes you think you're circling it and you actually mark through and write, you know, your circle gets in the wrong place and now they can't read it. So just don't write on your receipts. That helps them more than trying to help them. If you'll just leave it alone, put it in there and they can find what they need. Shelly, what were you going to say? Please make sure when you upload the receipt that it is the correct receipt. If, if <laughs> it is quarter two and you upload the quarter one tuition payment, that we're going to kick it back and make you resubmit the whole expense report because we have to have the correct receipt. Please make sure that you send all receipts to us. Even if it's a refunded receipt, show that refund to us. We need to see that also. Okay. I also asked Shelly Marissa if you have to have a scanner and scan your receipt in, or if you can just use your phone and take a picture of it. And they gave me good news and said, as long as it's legible and it captures, you know, the top and the bottom of the receipt, you know, they can see the whole thing. They've got to be able to see the name of the business, the total, you know, everything in between and it's not blurry, they can actually read it, they're good. It doesn't have to be on a fancy scanner somewhere. They're good with photos. Marissa? It must be a clear receipt. So if you cannot read the receipt, we cannot read the receipt. <laughs> please send, if you, if you decide to take a picture, please send a clear receipt. <laughs> a, Very good point. A suggestion I have, and I think this is probably a good time to do it, is when you're doing this, realize that what you're submitting to us receipt-wise has to balance and match with what you are spending on your debit card. So I recommend that you balance the receipts with the debit card to make sure that those actually match. Because if they do not match, we're going to have to, to email you and explain to you, you know, you're missing a receipt or this amount does not match. And we're going to have to I use this word, kick it back to you to refill out this whole expense report again. And neither one of us really want to do that. You don't want to do it. We don't want to do it. Very good point. That just delays the whole process. And we know you guys are busy. You don't have time to be filling out another form just for fun. So we want it to be correct the first time you, you send it to us. So we don't have to do all of that back and forth. And also make sure if you make or make a payment of some kinds with your debit card on the last two or three days of the month, that it actually clears during that expense reporting time. We have a lot of times where tuition payments are made, say, on September 30th. And 
but they don't clear on the debit card to maybe a week later. That's not within the reporting period. So unfortunately, we can't include that in that quarter one or whatever quarter we're in expense report because it hasn't technically cleared off the debit card yet. That's a great point. That is a good point. I think we need to, to think through that one just a little bit more. I know that I was paying bills this weekend for myself. And when I was looking at my credit card, I had a lot of pending things on my credit card where we'd been uh, running errands this weekend. And I had charged a few things and they were still listed as pending. They had not cleared my credit card yet. So that's kind of what you're talking about, right, Shelly, that if they have paid something with their debit card, but it's not posted to their debit card yet, they do not include that on their expense report. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay. So, uh, Shelly Marissa, I'm, I don't have the curse of knowledge here. So, tell me, how do they look on their debit card to see what's posted? It's it's September 30th, and expense reports are due on October 1st. So what do they do to be able to balance their receipts to their debit card and be able to see their debit card statement, if you will? Um, way to go uh, provides a way for all account holders to view their um, um, debit cards online. If you don't have access to that, you will need to contact the way to go um, um, card service in order to get access to um, the online account. Um, we are unfortunately um, uh, we unfortunately we are unable to give you access to um, the online um, debit card. Uh, transaction. So you will need to contact the debit card in order to gain that access. So they just call that number on the back of their debit card? That is correct. And they will walk okay. them through how to um, um, see their transactions online. Perfect. Good deal. So after we upload our receipts, we're back to remember when we did that, I did not spend any money on in this quarter and it asked for the additional comments. Well, now we've spent a lot of money in the quarter. We've answered all of the questions. We've uploaded our receipts and we get back to that same uh, screen where it asks for additional comments. And it's the same instructions that you had before where Shelly told us if you've gotten any refunds during that quarter that you're going to to explain those here you're going to tell them uh, what happened all the whatever money came back so that they can look and understand what's going on if you ran out of space on your on your curriculum you had bought more than seven pieces of curriculum please do not enter them here in additional comments you're going to have to start over with a new expense report to do that. It's not okay just to start listing things like that in your additional comments. What else, guys, do we need to tell everybody about additional comments? You can with that same idea. If you want to put uh, additional expense report for additional curriculum um, is coming or something like that, that's fine that you put that there. Some people feel more secure in letting us know that. So that's fine. To kind of link them together. That makes sense. Good deal. So then we're going to say next and you get back to those assurances where you're saying, I promise I'm not lying about my expense report. And then you sign it. My signature stayed in there from the one we did earlier. And like I said, it's defaulting to today's date. And then you're going to submit the form. I'm going to go ahead and submit. Shelly Marissa, when you get Izzy's expense report, you can delete that one. So I'm submitting my expense report. And it's going to tell you, thank you for submitting your expense report. You're also going to get an email that says something to that effect that you've submitted your expense report. We always say to keep those kind of things in case something in the world goes crazy. You've got proof that you submitted your expense report, but you're done. You have, you're done until you hear from Shelly and Marissa. If they send you a beautiful email that says your expense report is approved, you can pat yourself on the back and say you did a great job. Or they may send you a, an email that says, um, hey, something's not working here. We, we're not able to balance this with what you spent on your debit card. And they'll work with you. It's not like they uh, boot you out of the program when something goes wrong. 
Uh, I've seen them work meticulously with account holders to get things worked out with uh, expense reports. So uh, we want things to go smoothly so that we're not having to uh, to stalk you and to hound you over something like this. But please know that these ladies are here to support you and to work with you. So um, we want we want to to be there to help you and your student. But we also am asking for for your help in getting things done correctly the first time so that we don't have to keep bothering you throughout this process. So Shelly Marissa, I'm gonna ask for any last comments before we let everybody go. Good luck, okay. everyone. Yeah, good luck. If you have any questions <laughs> about anything on this expense report, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're always here to answer any questions. Yes, I'm going to go back to our main page and show you our contact information one last time. Remember, you can leave us a voicemail at 615-253-3781, or you can email us at iea.questions at tn.gov. We are more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks a lot.